Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There's a story told of a man who decided to buy a grandfather clock. So he went to the local antique shop and there was this huge grandfather clock sitting there. He paid the money and then he thought, how am I going to get this home? Well, he lived just around the corner and it didn't seem a lot of sense to hire a van. So he lifted the grandfather clock, put it on his shoulder and decided to walk home. But as he turned the corner, he just happened to hit a cyclist and the cyclist fell off his bike. And the cyclist lying on the ground shouted up, why don't you wear a wristwatch like everyone else? <laughs> I don't know what your favourite timepiece is. It could be a wristwatch, it could be a grandfather clock, it could be a mobile phone, I'm not sure. But pretty much all the time, we are aware of time and its passing. In everything we do, we're conscious that one thing is going to come to the end and the next thing is going to begin. And we've got to keep moving. Every generation has been concerned with time. But I think perhaps our generation maybe is more concerned than others. We're at a stage of instant everything. We don't like to wait. Instant cash, instant coffee, instant deliveries. It's not even instant cash, it's beep. It's instant. Instant replies, instant answers. And I think as the years go by, time does seem to pass more quickly. Christmas does seem to come around quicker and quicker. And human beings throughout history, have, they've always tried to understand time. They've always tried to get a grip of it. Some have observed history or, or the story of time as the march of progress, the ascent of man. I think that's quite hard to say after world wars and maybe even harder in recent days. H.L. Fisher was a, a famous historian of Europe, European history, and in the preface of his book he writes, men wiser and more learned than I have discerned in history a plot, a rhythm, a pattern. These harmonies are concealed from me. I can only see one emergency following another as wave follows wave. So many people have tried to make sense of history, of time. But what about you? Can you see meaning? Can you see rhythm? Can you see order in the passing of time? And what about our friend here, the preacher? As you've, we had a, I think we needed a break last week from the preacher. But he's been observing life, hasn't he? Trying to make sense of it all. And now in chapter 3, he decides to observe time. And let's see what he says about it. Let's see how he makes sense of it. And I've got three points. The first one is, there is an ordered rhythm to time. There's an ordered rhythm. You, you see that in the poem of verses 1 to 8. It's a, it's a beautiful poem. It's a great poem. You have that opening statement in, in verse 1. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And then what follows is 14 pairs of contrasts, which seem to cover all of life's basic experiences and deepest emotions. A time to be born and a time to die, verse two. A time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep. A time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. I think it was the birds, was it? The birds? Yes. They were a pop group, weren't they, some time ago? And they thought, these are wonderful words, let's make it into a song. And it does reflect the beauty of time. You have that recurring phrase, a time, a time, a time. And even the way the poem's written, it's as if it's like a clock, it's ticked. Talk, tick tock, a time, a time, a time. And it tells us that time isn't entirely random. This poem suggests to us that there are natural rhythms built into it. There's an order to time. And the time is beautiful, verse 11. 
He has made everything beautiful in its time. And who's the he? It's our creator. It's, it's God. And the preacher seems to be saying that time is ordered. It's under the, the providential control of God who set everything up in the first place. So time isn't random. And I think we have an inbuilt sense that it's, that, that it's ordered. I think we have that instinct that there is a time for everything, a time for different events, different actions. Just as a, a year passes and you, you have the change of seasons, you know, from, from spring to summer to autumn to winter. And there's beauty in that. It's the same with life, isn't it? You have the spring of life. A child is born, it's awesome, it's new, it's fresh. But then the springtime is replaced by the, the energy of summer. And then that's replaced by the slower pace of autumn. And if we learn not to resist it, we can see beauty in autumn. There's a growing solidity, there's an increasing peace. And then autumn comes to the winter of old age. Our society doesn't think much of old age, but there is a beauty in old age, the slower pace, the longer perspective on life. And so we have that in instinct, life is not stationary. There's rhythm, there's, there's movement from birth to death. That's why the preacher begins verse two, a time to be born, a time to die. And we feel instinctively there's a right time for those events. There is a time to be born, there is a time to die. And life is ordered, it's not random. I think the preacher is saying if we're wise, we'll recognize the order, we'll recognize the rhythms, and we'll see in them that they're even from a loving God. And we'll accept the seasons, and we'll even adjust to the seasons, and we'll live appropriately in the seasons. So verse 4, there, there is a time to weep, a time to mourn, a time to laugh and a time to dance. And if you do the wrong thing at the wrong season, you will get in trouble. So when the coffin's being lowered, it's not a time to laugh. It's not a time to dance. We have to behave appropriately. Going swimming in winter, it's not the right time. Not even the summer's the right time. <laughs> But there is an appropriate time for everything. In verse 5, there's a, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. I think the casting of stones, it, it seems to speak about action against your enemy. You ruin his garden, you ruin his field. It's useless. You, you cast stones on it. But I think many, many more times there is a time to gather stones. To help a friend to have peace. Verse 5. We're not to relate to all people in the same way. Verse 5. There's a time to embrace. But please don't embrace me. There's a time to embrace. And there's a time to refrain from embracing. And please make sure you know the difference. Verse 7. There's a time to keep silent. And there's a time to speak. There is that time to shut up, to be silent, hold back. And others to have that time, speak, speak up. We need your wisdom. And we need to adjust to the different situations of life, the different seasons. And you need to live appropriately in the right season. Over the last few months, I've been in conversation with someone, someone and they're anticipating a new season in life. They're, they're coming to retirement and they're thinking, what can I do in God's kingdom? What can I do for God? How can I serve him? Think I'm going to have a lot more time. Things are going to be different. He started to think about, intentionally think about the kingdom of God. How can I, how can I serve him in this new season? And there's a time to give up certain things. But there's also a time to build certain things, to start things. I'm glad we're, we're, we're out of lockdown, but I think lockdown was helpful because it caused us to stop and to think 
And for some it was like, what is life about? And perhaps lockdown helped people to think about God. And perhaps you're here this morning because you had all that time to think what life is about. And so that's a really good thing. You've responded to that appropriately. Now you're thinking about God. Maybe for older persons, I'll keep my head down. It's a time to accept help and family and church friends. Perhaps it's a time to tear down and stop something. Perhaps something has run its course in your life. And it's time it's finished. Let's try something new, even if we feel out of our depth. Let's try to build something. Jack S. Wine, one of the, he writes a few book on Ecclesiastes and he says this, the adjustment of seasons challenges old and young alike. Many of our frustrations rise from our blindness to the change of seasons. And we struggle to adjust our expectations. I think that's wise advice. We find ourselves in different seasons, different times, live appropriately or you will struggle or you'll be frustrated things change if we're living in the past and we're trying to hang on to something in the past you'll miss the opportunity of the present i remember as a young christian i was i wouldn't say i was obsessed maybe i was obsessed sort of with reformed reformers and all the old guys i love those old guys and I sort of spoke like the old guys in sort of ancient language and stuff. And one man graciously came up to me. He wasn't that gracious. He came up to me and said, you know, that man you're talking about, he, he was a man of God in his day. You're to be a man of God in your day. And we can learn from the past, definitely. If we don't know our past, we don't know how we've got here in the present. We don't know where we're going, the tra trajectory we're on, and we need it. But we can't miss the opportunity for the present. Or if you're the type of person who dreams about the future, you're more optimistic than I am. You've lots of hopes. Some people get caught in that world and they, they forget to live and to be faithful and to be relevant in the present. And we need to acknowledge there is an order to time. And we need to accept it. We need to adjust to live in these different times. There is ordered rhythm in time. And then, as you can guess, if you've been here with Ecclesiastes, things go wrong for us at this moment. Now you have a frustrating bondage. A frustrating bondage. There's a gear change for the preacher. God has made everything beautiful in its time. But the preacher doesn't stop there. As we've seen in chapter 1 and chapter 2, he is brutally honest, isn't he? He just comes out with it. He says what he sees. He is ruthless. And now he brings out the negative side to the rhythms of time. Verse 9. I think people forget there's verse 9 when they read verses 1 to 8. You sort of hear verses 1 to 8 at weddings and funerals and lovely events and then they, they, they don't follow on verse 9. What profit has the worker from that in which he labours? And it's as if the preacher is saying, time with his pendulum swing, it does give a sense of order. There is the backwards forwards tick tock. But the swing of the pendulum is out of our control. And we can't slow down the pendulum and we can't speed it up. And it's as if the pendulum determines what season we're in, what we're going through. And perhaps at the moment for you, it is a moment of laughter. Perhaps it is a moment of dancing, a moment of peace. But we all know, don't we, the pendulum will swing. You wouldn't choose for it to swing and bereavement will come broken relationships will happen there'll be a crisis at work there'll be a global crisis and perhaps now it is a time to weep a time to refrain from embracing a time for war and it's as if the preacher is saying it's actually time that dictates to us 
We don't control time. Time has its grip on us. Verse 10, I have seen the God-given task, the God-given burden with which the sons of men are to be occupied. So on one hand, there is a beauty. There is a rhythm. There is an order. But there's also a deep frustration. Another exam for Magabo to do. He's not here this morning, but another exam or another two to do the next day. Another Christmas. Another birthday. Another hospital appointment. There's a bondage. There's a frustration. And the more we see the pendulum returning, like the preacher, we we feel trapped by time and its rhythms. We can't reconcile ourselves with time. We have this uneasy relationship with time. I think C.S. Lewis puts it the best. He says, we're so little reconciled to time. We're so uneasy with time that we are even astonished by it. We say, how time flies. And then he says, it's as strange as saying about a fish If a fish were repeatedly surprised by the wetness of water, how time flies. We're not used to it. It's as if the fish would say, how wet the sea is again. (laughs) And that, says Lewis, would be strange indeed, unless, of course, the fish were destined one day to become a land animal. Do you see what Lewis is getting at? He's saying we're so uneasy with time. We're so dissatisfied with time. Could it be that we're made for another world? Another sphere of existence. We're made not for this time, but for eternity. Verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts and so for all the beauty that there is for all the order in the world there is a sense within us and i think we instinctively feel it that something still isn't right there must be something else there must be something more but look at what he says in verse 11 but we can't work it out what is the something more Except, verse 11, that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. So we have this longing within ourselves that there has to be more. Time is frustrating. There must be something more. And yet the preacher says, I can't work it out. I'm trapped within this world of space and time. I had to change my views about the donkey sanctuary. Aris had a quiet word with me about the donkey sanctuary. But there is a maze. There is a maze of the donkey sanctuary, isn't there? Like there is a maze. You go out the back, you keep on walking as far as you can go, and you come across a maze. And it's as if the preacher is saying, the don- you pass the donkeys, but you say they're lovely donkeys. You keep going. It comes to the donkeys, and you think there is a maze, and it has been planted. There's an order and beauty about the maze. But you get in the maze, and you're stuck. And you come to a dead end and you go another way and you get up to another dead end and you can't get out of it though you see there's a beauty and order to it and it's as if that's what the preacher is feeling about time yes there's an order but i can't work it out there has to be more to this but i can't figure it out and he comes up against dead ends he talks about injustice but i think the big one that he talks about is death And that's not a surprise because he brings this up again and again. And he can't get a handle on it. He can't understand it. If you look at verse 19, man's fate is like that of the animals. The same fate awaits them both. As one dies, so dies the other. All have the same breath. Man has no advantage over the animal. Everything is meaningless. He's caught in this maze and he can't make sense of it. We're all the same. We're all going the same way. Verse 20, all go to the same place, all come from dust, and to dust all return. Who knows if the spirit of man rises up, and if the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth. You remember Solomon Grundy, born on Monday, christened on Tuesday, married on Wednesday, together on Thursday, worship Friday, died on Saturday, 
buried on Sunday, this is the end of Sodom and Grundy. Is that all life is about? A short journey, nothingness to nothingness. And yet instinctively the preacher and we know there's more. I don't know what the more is, but there's more. He has put eternity in our hearts. And he doesn't know how to find it. And he doesn't know how to reach it. And it's as if he's, he sees the beauty of the order of creation and time, but he also sees the frustration of it. What am I to do? And that brings us to our final point. We have ultimate fulfillment. Our final point, there is hope. We're left asking the question, does the preacher offer us anything? And I think he does offer us something. I don't think it's very much, but he does offer us some pointers. In verse 12 and 13, he says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. It is the gift of God. Or verse 22. So I saw that there is nothing better for a man than to enjoy his work. Because that is his lot. And so he's not giving us lots of hope. But there's a glimmer here. You see for the preacher. He's like everyone else. He has a sense of eternity. He has a sense of God. He has a sense of right and wrong. He has a sense that God will come and judge and put everything right. But he can't make sense of it all. He can't see it. He's still trapped in the maze. So in the meantime, he says, receive the good things from God. Fear him. Verse 14. Everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to and nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that men will revere him. Fear God. Continue to receive his gifts. Thank him for them. Thank him for them. It's a bit like Dylan Thomas, this poem. Fern Hill. And he says this. As I was young and easy under the apple boughs, time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying something like what the preacher is saying. Here he is as a boy, but he's green, he's enjoying it, but he's dying. He's living, but he's trapped by the chains. But he's still singing. And it's as if the preacher is saying, sing. Yes, you're trapped by time. But enjoy what God has given to you. It's been a gift from him to you. Enjoy that. So there's a glimmer of hope. Not much hope. But I think the rest of the Bible fills in the rest for us. Galatians 4.4 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son. And when we read the rest of the Bible, it helps us to understand time. Because when we read Galatians 4.4, 4, straight away it tells us that time isn't really like a pendulum going back and forth. There's a purpose in time. God has created the world at the beginning and time began and the Lord Jesus Christ will return and he will bring time to that great conclusion when he will usher in the new heavens and the new earth and there will be a judgment and there will be heaven and hell. But this verse tells us that God came from outside of time. And he entered the pendulum swing of the tick and the talk. And he came into time to liberate us from time. To liberate us from the maze of time's frustrating bondage. That's why Jesus Christ came. Yes, time is beautiful. Yes, there's order, but there's a frustration to it. And the Lord Jesus Christ has come in the fullness of time to liberate us 
from that frustration. And if you look at verse 2, birth followed by death, birth followed by death. The Lord Jesus came to break the cycle, didn't he? He was born, and yes, he died, but he didn't remain dead. He was raised on the third day, and he breaks the cycle. On the cross, when he was taking upon himself the sins of his people, and he died, he didn't remain dead. And he broke through the barrier of death. He was a mighty victor who came. And in his death and in his resurrection, he provides the way for us to break out of time's frustration, time's bondage. And he liberates us. And so this morning, if you do see beauty in time and in the seasons, and there's an order and a rhythm there, and if you also see the frustration in time, that you're not in control of it, that it has actually us in its grip, then I hope you can see how when you trust in Jesus, he releases you from that. And he actually gives us entrance into that eternal life, into that eternal time. Perhaps you're not convinced about that this morning. I urge you to keep asking your questions. Keep trying to find out. And for those of us who are Christians, for those of us trusting in Christ today, I think it's important for us to, we need to acknowledge we need to acknowledge that we still live in time and time is still frustrating and we still go through the seasons and the pendulum keeps on ticking and it's not in our control and there will be good times and there will be very tough times but Paul says don't despair because ultimately time is heading for future fulfillment when Christ the King returns, when he comes to gather his people in again. And even in the tough times in life, keep your eyes fixed on the God who broke into time, the one who reigns in eternity, the one who is the ruler of the universe, because one day he will come again and he will bring you home to that place where there is no time to eternity where our hearts will no longer be frustrated where we'll feel no more bondage where we'll be truly free and liberated in Christ so you can keep trusting him in everything he knows what he's doing in time until he comes Again. Let's pray and then we'll sing together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to see this world and time as we should. Help us to see it as under your sovereign control. We pray that you would keep us focused on your Son in the, in the good times and in the tough times. Help us to trust him for all the seasons of life, in trouble and in joy. And help us as we look forward to Christ's return, to that great climax of history. Help us to live to bring glory to your name. And we do pray in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen.